Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through the entire book of Revelation. And it's 2021, and we're still going. We are still going just a little bit at a time, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, uh, taking the book in small, bite-sized, easy to access, easy to understand chunks. We are now in Revelation chapter 13. And Revelation chapter 13, very popular chapter because it concerns the number of the beast. It concerns the beast himself, the Antichrist. And uh, I remember growing up, people talking about the Antichrist ever since I can remember, always trying to figure out uh, who the Antichrist was because they have all these clues here in chapter 13 and people have kind of taken it upon themselves to crack the code. I remember uh, people thinking it was John D. Rockefeller. Uh, People uh, were sending around emails back in the day that it was Bill Gates, that it was Microsoft. I remember when I first moved to Texas, everybody told me that it was Barack Obama. But uh, I think as we read through Revelation chapter 13, uh, we'll get some clues, we'll get some insight as to um, what, just what to look for, right? Because I think that um, we always assume that people are going to be becoming less religious in the future, that religion is going to go away, that we're trying to do away with religion. But when you read Revelation chapter 13, you see that that's not really the case. People are still worshiping. There's still a one world uh, government, but there's also a one world religion. And that it, it's really the opposite. People are religious in the end times. They're just not Christian. And there's going to be this one world false religion that is being spearheaded by the Antichrist. But see, that's the great thing about being Christian. And that's the great thing about having this, that we have the Bible, that we have God's word, because it's telling us how things are going to go down, right? We are reading it right now. We're studying it for ourselves and we are seeing the clues. We are fortunate enough to have this book and to read this book. And this is why I think studying Revelation is so important that that we have these insights early on. Revelation 13 begins, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. So this is our final world ruler. And we did uh, cover the numbers here a month ago, but let me just refresh you. Uh, Seven heads, these are the seven successive world empires. So throughout our world's history, there have been six major uh, empires that have tried to have global domination, and the fact that there's going to be a seventh in the distant future, our our future, there'll be a seventh. You think about um, empires like Greece, or Rome, or Persia, or Egypt, right? So this is this is in that same line that there will one day be a seventh, and that's the the final one. Verse two says, "And the beast that I saw was like a leopard; its feet." were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Now, what does this mean? It means um, that this kingdom, this last seventh global kingdom, is like these three other past kingdoms. So um, the different animals are compared to other global kingdoms in Daniel chapter 7. So again, this is Babylon, Persia, and Greece. So it's kind of like they're saying this new seventh world empire is like uh, Babylon, Persia, and Greece had a baby. (laughs) That's the way we would say it today. Let me read that whole chapter two, uh, verse two again. It says, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So who gives the beast, who gives the dragon its power? Satan, right? Satan gives them his power. Verse 3 says, One of its heads 
seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Well, this passage says the whole world will marvel, right? The whole world. So the whole world will see this, they'll know about it, and they will marvel at it. So what would that take? What would it take for the whole world to marvel at something? Because I think we're, we're pretty skeptical, right? You know, we see something and, you know, we want to pick it apart and find all the flaws to it. But yet, in this instance, the whole world notices. So it could be, you know, a, a wonderful story, an act of heroism, an act of bravery, some sort of story where they said it was against all odds. He shouldn't have survived, but he did. You know, he shouldn't have lived, but he did. And that's probably what is happening. It says that the head wound is fatal, that it would kill you. And perhaps that's what happens. Perhaps uh, this individual receives uh, a head wound of some sort that anybody would say, they're dead. And yet they come back to life. When I mean, you think about an anti-Christ, what is the thing about Christ that sets him apart from everybody else? He died and came back to life. Why wouldn't then the Antichrist do the same thing? Have some sort of head wound that the world sees, acknowledges, and says, yes, by all accounts, they should be dead, and yet they come back to life. And then instead of being like Christ and giving that glory and attention and worship and praise back to God, the Antichrist tells the world, this is all me, right? I did this on my own accord. This is my power. And so the world worships him. And then not only do the, does the world worship him, but the world worships the, the devil for where he gets his power from. Verse five, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling that is, those who dwell in heaven. All right, there's a lot here. Um, the first is, not only does the Antichrist seem to have this weird power, but he's also a very persuasive speaker, very eloquent speaker. When he speaks, the world listens. And then the Bible says he speaks for three and a half years with total authority. But notice, it says that he's allowed authority. For three and a half years. Now, why would the Bible say he's allowed authority? Well, because God's still in control, right? God's still in control, even when it seems like the world will be out of control, even when it seems like there's a one world religion and it's not Christianity, even when there is a blasphemous, idolatrous leader running everything, that we as Christians can recognize that God is still in control even when the world seems to be spiraling out of control, even when it seems the monkeys are running the show, even when it seems like there's a wall of division and two sides can't seem to come together, the Bible says that God allows these things to take place. There are reminders that no matter what, God is still in control. He is still in charge. He still has the power. Verse 7 says, Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. What does that mean? Well, that's us, right? The, the Antichrist is allowed by God to harm Christians. You know, we, we think that being a Christian means that we're safe from harm, that we're protected. You know, we'll, we'll pray for a hedge of protection, right? Or we'll pray for traveling mercies. But the, re the truth is, um, we are all subject to God's whim. And while this is his world and, and he is in charge, sometimes that means um, we can go through pain. We can go through loss. We can be persecuted. And the Bible says that God allows that to happen. Verse 7 continues and says, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, 
everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. Remember, this is global, right? This is global. So it's not about America. It's not about Russia. It's not about China. This is a worldwide story. This is a worldwide phenomenon. And everyone follows the beast. Everyone except Christians. They're the only ones. And the Bible says Christians will be persecuted for it. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, if anyone is to be taken captive, who's that? You, right? Christians. This is, this is, a, this is a call to you. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. This is one of those passages that says, listen, pay attention, dial in right now. If you are arrested, you're going to be arrested. If you're going to be persecuted for your faith, that's what's going to happen. If you're going to be tortured, you're going to be tortured. If you're going to be killed, you're going to be killed. This is how the story goes. This is that part of time that you're living in. Can you imagine I mean, it's, it's the Bible. God says it will happen. God says there are Christians that won't escape. That's just how it goes. Can you imagine being a non-Christian and reading this? Hey, you want to sign up for our club? Sure, sounds great. Okay, just bear in mind, you know, though, um, you could be arrested. What? Yeah, and uh, you could be uh, tortured. Or killed. You could be killed, too. Would you be as quick to... Sign your name on the dotted line. I mean, think about how easy we have it in 2021, right? Going to church is easy. Being a Christian is not that difficult for those of us who live in America. It doesn't cost us much. But there are people right now who are persecuted for their faith. There are people right now that could be arrested, that take the risk of being arrested for assembling freely and going to church, right? And if that were the case, if that were you, if that were where you lived, would you still do it? Would you still go to church if you knew that you could be arrested for it? Or would you go all the way and would you die for your faith? Jesus says in Luke 6, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their father did to the prophets. I think to remember um, in those days that come, I think what we need to remember is, you know, the world doesn't hate you. It's going to feel like the world is against you, but that really won't be the case. The world hates you because of Jesus. The darkness hates the light because of what it exposes. John 15 says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. See, Jesus makes that distinction. Jesus even says, Hey, the world hates the me inside of you. The world hates Jesus. The world hates the message of Jesus. The world hates what Jesus offers, what Jesus brings. And it's not you. It's not you. And I think there's um, the desire sometimes to take things personally, right? But but we don't need to do that. Even now, even now. And, And I know you're not being perhaps persecuted for your faith even now. But listen, 1 John 3, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Romans 5, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We, We are probably not being persecuted today, but we can still be hated. We can still be insulted. We can still be made fun of. We can still be put down and shamed, and maybe... Not for our faith even, but just for being us. Just for being ourselves. The good news is 
It's not our job to impress the world. It's not our job to gain the world's affection. The Bible says that you have the most important admirer you could ever ask for. God calls you his own. God loves you. And that's all we need. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.